So, okay, great segue over to the man, Bradley Metrock. He's our keynote speaker for today's event. Bradley Metrock is CEO of Nashville-based Score Publishing, which helps creators find a voice. He's founded the podcast network Voice First FM, has many, many popular shows, including This Week in Voice. He's been quoted by organizations as diverse as the Mayo Clinic to Forbes and Harvard Business Review. He, prevented, he presented at Nashville Voice Conference 2019, Healthcare and Voice. And we're very, very excited to have Bradley as our keynote speaker. So I'm going to queue up Bradley, and then we're going to do a live Q&A with Bradley. Hi, my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you very much to Paul Hickey and to The Voice event for inviting me to come and be part of what he's put together. This is phenomenal for voice and it's phenomenal for the city of Nashville. I was part of it last year, got to see the, the beginnings, um, which were in person. I'm honored to be giving this keynote today, and we all look forward to when we can convene again safely um, and, and gather together in person. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and what my company does, and then I'm going to tell you several areas where voice and the conversational AI that sits underneath it have already had a significant impact on society, our culture, our businesses, our personal lives, the world around us. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start this from the beginning. So thank you again to the voice event. Uh, this is phenomenal. Honor to be part of this. Um, really cool what, what Paul, uh, you managed to do and your team. So again, my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. We're not a normal publisher. I host a podcast that has become very popular um, called This Week in Voice. Uh, my biggest guest so far has been Mark Cuban. You're looking at him right here. Um, season, that was uh, the season three finale uh, season five starts this fall. We basically convene a panel each week of luminaries, high-level executives, and uh, founders, all working with voice and AI and talk about the news of the week. Um, we're fortunate that, uh, that the show is as well-liked as it is. Uh, I wrote this uh, for Harvard Business Review called Your Company Needs a Strategy for Voice Technology. Boy, is that true. And all the pandemic has done is serve to accelerate that. We put on Project Voice, which is the number one event for voice technology and AI in America. Typically, we say it comes a week after CES. This, this go around, I'm not sure if CES will be taking place or not. I guess we'll get to find out. But uh, Project Voice certainly will. It's in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which uh, many Nashville people do not know that Chattanooga has the fastest internet in the United States, believe it or not. And uh, it's, a, um, it's a beautiful place in addition to being a tech-savvy place. This past January, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Samsung were all sponsors, presenting sponsors of Project Voice. And this year, once again, we'll be taking a good look at the Alexa ecosystem, the Google Assistant ecosystem, and the Bixby ecosystem for Samsung, as well as all the, the litany of many, many, many other players uh, that make up the voice and AI world. And um, it's a perfect place to come if your organization is getting more into voice and you want to find out what ecosystems you should be playing in, who, should, who you should be partnering with. This Week in Voice VIP, this is my daily letter uh, on Substack, if you're familiar with that, to those working with voice technology and conversational AI. Um, this is an uh, incredible resource 
Uh, if you're uh, attending this conference today, if you don't take anything else away from this, uh, this week in Voice VIP might be a very good resource for you um, just to start your day off with the same information that uh, all sorts of uh, very high-level folks are starting their day off with, uh, all about uh, the emergence of voice and AI across uh, every vertical and every walk of life. So that's enough about me. Let's let's get down to, to business here. Um, we use the word, the phrase, the, the, the term voice first. And this is an interesting term. Uh, I want to talk about it for a moment. So when we're born and even when we're in the womb, all we have is our mother's voice. And it's just part of our humanity, this thing called voice. Um, we know it from the very beginning. And from there, we go on and uh, quickly thereafter develop an inner voice that will guide us for the rest of our life. So it always stood to reason that as technology evolved over time, that it would arc toward being voice-driven, voice-oriented, what we call voice first. So once you accept that voice is not a fad or uh, some sort of gimmick, I think we've seen enough out of it to, to where we know that that's true at, at this point, then you start to break down what's happened and, and what we expect to happen from here. We're gonna be talking about that uh, in this presentation. So what you're looking at here is two uh, bar charts for that voicebot.ai produced, voicebot.ai, a uh, phenomenal website for news and commentary for voice technology. If you're not familiar with it, you should get familiar with it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to go. So the bottom chart, um, well, the title of the, the whole graphic is U.S. Smart Speaker Market Share by Brand. So uh, the bottom chart is from 2019, and it shows that Amazon had a market share of over 60%, while Google was right around 25%. Then, if you look at the top bar chart, uh, 2020, a year later, Amazon clocks in at 53%, while Google has risen up to nearly 31%. So while Amazon de decreased 8% over, you know, year over year, Google increased 7%. <clears throat> so that's essentially a zero-sum game. What Google takes from Amazon, um, it takes fully uh, at the expense of uh, the other independent players and even companies like Apple. Um, and that's a very interesting dynamic that will, that will underlie everything we're about to discuss. Because if you're sitting here watching this presentation, you're thinking about voice technology, you're thinking about AI, you're thinking about how your company or your organization can take advantage of what's going on. It is critical information to know that Amazon and Google are embarking on this duopoly, this, um, this rivalry where uh, they are competing for finite resources and they're gonna have to compete hard with one another. And um, you don't know which one of these juggernauts is, is gonna win, but you know that you're gonna win by virtue of uh, the competition. And um, we've seen this over and over again uh, in different markets, different emerging technologies and we're seeing it play out right now. So what I'm gonna do right now is go through a number of early successes for voice technology. And what's important here is to realize that voice technology and, and the impact it's having on our world is not something that academics are pontificating on in an ivory tower somewhere. It, this is happening right here and right now, and it's been happening for a while. So I'm going to go through these examples um, and paint you a picture of the impact that voice technology is having on our, on our world. The first example here is Novel Effect. So Novel Effect is a 
company based out of Seattle that was the very first company to be signed up for uh, the Alexa Accelerator powered by Techstars, which is an incubator that Amazon created to support early stage companies that had uh, designs on using Alexa. And what this company does is they have produced technology that essentially will listen to one human being reading a book to another human being out loud. Primarily, we're talking about children's books here. So I could be reading Cat in the Hat to our eight-year-old son, and Novel Effect will detect that I'm reading Cat in the Hat. It'll detect that I'm reading Chapter 4, <clears throat> and it will marry up this uh, really well-produced um, soundscape, this music and the, these audio effects, to be in sync with where I'm reading the book to my son. And that sounds like a gimmick. It sounds like a, something that really doesn't matter. But what Novel Effect has discovered is that when you marry up these sound effects to and the, the, the music, the soundscape, to the reading from one human being to another of a book, that reading comprehension explodes. And so Novel Effect has... Um, really gained this very interesting foothold with voice and education. And uh, we're starting to see more things come out with voice and education, but Novel Effect was the first, and they've gone on to Soaring Heights. They turned down an offer that they got on the TV show Shark Tank to go raise millions of dollars privately from the marketplace, and uh, just a phenomenal uh, success story. So the second example here is the Stephen King Library. This is an Alexa skill, so a skill being uh, the nomenclature Amazon uses for app uh, that is uh, within the Alexa ecosystem. So uh, Simon & Schuster, in conjunction with uh, an agency called Skill Creative, put together something called the Stephen King Library. So you activate this with Alexa, and uh, the Stephen King Library will ask you, okay, what's the latest Stephen King book that you've read out of the 50 or so that he's written? And uh, then they'll start asking you a bunch of other questions that seemingly have nothing to do with uh, anything. And using the answers to those questions, it will then cook up a list of the next Stephen King books that uh, you should read. And what's really interesting about this Alexa skill is that this is the closest thing or one of the closest things we have to what the future of AI driven media discovery will look like. So um, the future of media discovery is not going to Google and hoping that you stumble across something or being on Amazon, you buy one thing, it says people who bought that bought these other things. And that's how you find out. No, the future of discovery is these AI driven voice assistants telling you, what, based on your context and based on your information um, and what is observed, um, what you ought to be paying attention to. And this is the closest thing that we've seen to that um, so far. Alexa, what am I holding is the next one. And if you have an Echo Show or if you have an uh, Amazon Echo device with a front-facing camera, super super neat feature uh, of that where you can hold up a, an item in front of the camera and say, Alexa, what am I holding? And uh, the Echo Show, we'll just use that as the example, the Echo Show will look at the item, it'll ask you to spin it around, and it'll look at it, and if that item has a barcode, then it will figure out what you're holding from that standpoint, and It'll determine, okay, is this something that Amazon sells? Do you want to order it or reorder it? Uh, whatever the case may be. Um, if it's something that uh, does not have a barcode, it will do the best it can using machine learning to figure out what you're holding. And um, this has incredible implications um, for accessibility, for aging populations. Um, for many people who are older, this alone is a reason to buy an Echo Show and have it uh, in the home 
Um, if you are low vision, no vision, uh, it could be a lifesaver. The next thing here is Alexa Guard. So Alexa Guard is the feature within uh, Amazon Alexa that the vast majority of people have no idea exists where um, you can basically set a home alarm using Alexa, uh, but the functionality, what's interesting about this runs way deeper than, than that. Um, Alexa Guard will listen for um, its surroundings. So it will listen to your home if it's in the home and listen to your office if it's in the office and it will establish baseline levels of audio. And if it hears something that is not in line with that baseline level of audio, if it hears a window break, uh, if it hears um, running water for longer than it should be hearing running water or a lot of water when it shouldn't be hearing any water, um, these sorts of things, uh, if it hears them, it will trigger a call to the police, a call to you, uh, a call to any number of other people um, and uh, be a guard. That's just like the name says, super interesting, has a lot of implications for insurance, has a lot of implications for um, accessibility as well. A very interesting feature that uh, Amazon has fairly quietly added. Google Recorder. So Google Recorder is functionality that Google has added to Google Assistant where Google will, uh, Google Assistant <coughs> can record um, audio conversations and uh, mainly speech and uh, transcribe it. And in some cases, I think they're, it's on the roadmap. I don't know if it's available yet. Tra translate it um, all locally offline without the internet. So it would be one thing to, to be able to record audio and uh, interact with that audio and uh, manipulate that audio uh, with internet access, but uh, without having internet access, being able to, to transcribe and, and in some cases translate audio in real time, <clears throat> that's tremendous. And uh, it's a big addition to Google Assistant, and it's a, the takeaway here is the importance of voice assistant functionality that doesn't rely on the internet. That's going to be a persistent theme as we move forward with voice and AI. <clears throat> the, uh, for, for some people who don't have internet access or have terrible internet access or intermittent internet access, um, being able to depend on voice assistants and these AIs um, absent uh, consistent and powerful internet is very profound and um, uh, opens up a lot of doors for what voice can do for us. <clears throat> so smart speakers and college freshmen, senior citizens. So there have been multiple studies so far, one done by Front Porch out in California, uh, a couple of others that have um, shown con conclusively that um, if you add smart speakers or voice assistants to um, the living environments of senior citizens, and we see the same thing play out with college freshmen, that uh, they become less depressed, less isolated, um, and uh, all the repercussions that come with that. So it's funny that we live in this so-called information age um, and we're surrounded by technology and yet we live more depressed and lonely lives than almost ever before. And uh, two groups of people are more lonely, more depressed, more isolated than everybody else. And those two groups are college freshmen and senior citizens. And those two groups share a lot in common. They're, they're, they often are both in different and brand new environments uh, in the absence of family and learning entirely new ways of life and ways of doing things. And um, they're, they're on their own in uh, very unique ways for the first time in their life. <clears throat> and um, 
it's really remarkable. Uh, the, the reasons why are not incredibly well understood, but um, the what is what is what matters here. The what is that you add smart speakers to these uh, groups of people and they, they become less depressed and uh, less isolated. And that leads to with college freshmen, they're more participatory. Uh, they <clears throat> attend class more often. Um, they make better grades and they kill themselves less. Senior citizens um, witness similar results. They're more participato participatory in their environment, um, have a better disposition, uh, greater adherence to their prescription drug regimens, and, um, and, all, and die less. So um, something really profound is happening here, and um, it's been studied enough to where we know it conclusively, but as we move forward, understanding more of that why <clears throat> and the, 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 com the complexities of the relationship between different groups and smart speakers and voice assistants and AI, um, that's going to be fascinating to see. Speech pathology and project understood. So one of the things that we observe right out, right out of the gate with smart speakers is that if you... Um, if you make them available to people who have speech impediments or speech challenges, like I did growing up, that, uh, you know, particularly children, um, that uh, the speech challenges and the speech impediments decline in severity uh, much more rapidly than what we normally see and what can be explained through therapy or through working with a speech coach or, or any number of other um, things that we typically do to address that. So what happens is you have children who have trouble speaking, maybe they have trouble saying particular sounds, maybe they have trouble pronouncing words, whatever it is, and being able to talk to Alexa or Google Assistant or Siri, Alexa, Siri, and Google Assistant couldn't care less if you're trying hard to say the words or to enunciate. Uh, all they know is that they either understand you or they don't. And children are able to, uh, er, people of any age, but uh, I'm just rolling with children for my example here. Children are able to um, practice. They're able to practice and practice and practice and say the words wrong. It doesn't recognize you. Say them again. It doesn't recognize you. Say them again a little bit better than the two previous times. Still doesn't recognize you. The hundredth time, finally, it recognizes it, and you've improved. Iter you've iterated uh, each time, and you've got a little bit better, and you've done it without the judgment of other human beings, um, and you've done it privately, and um, it's just phenomenal, the interplay between people who need help uh, learning how to enunciate words clearly and to speak better, and what these smart speakers and voice assistants um, do. And um, uh, it's super interesting. And what Project Understood is, it, it's sort of the next level off of that. So Project Understood is the collaboration, it's the joint venture between the Canadian Down Syndrome Society and Google. And uh, we were fortunate to have both these folks co-present at Project Voice earlier this year. So Project Understood um, is the collaboration between those two groups such that people who have Down syndrome, voice assistants typically have trouble understanding them. And uh, through the work of the Canadian Down Syndrome Society along with Google, if people who have Down syndrome are able to participate in this process where they record a number of phrases, submit that audio data to Google, and um, Google is able to aggregate all of that uh, audio information and consequently make Google Assistant uh, easier for people with Down syndrome to use and more under, allow people with Down syndrome to be more understood by the voice assistant. It's really remarkable. It's very moving work. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to look, look up Project Understood or Project Understood Google um, 
on YouTube and, and uh, enjoy the videos that you're going to find there. The final uh, early success here is Canary Speech and Carnegie Mellon. So <clears throat> uh, these two groups, Canary Speech is an independent company. Carnegie Mellon is an academic institution. The story here is that there's a lot of groups who are going beyond voice technology in terms of the words that are spoken. And instead, they're looking at the audio tones and the, the underlying audio quality uh, and the audio qualities of uh, the vocal intonations and the other properties of the human voice. <clears throat> Canary Speech is a company where their entire business is predicated on using uh, the output of our vocal cords to diagnose disease. It's fascinating stuff. Carnegie Mellon uh, specifically um, made news a couple of months ago through a project where they took a lot of human speech and were able to use that as a predictor of COVID-19. So Carnegie Mellon created technology where they could listen to your voice and actually predict if you have COVID-19 or if you've had it recently. Nothing that's been FDA approved or approved by any other government institution, but progress nevertheless and fascinating nevertheless. So those are some early successes and they collectively serve to paint a picture of the direction we're all moving in. I wanna just talk briefly in closing about um, the acceleration of voice that we're seeing thanks to this pandemic. So the rise of no touch technology or what we call touchless. So voice has a major role to play here. Uh, nobody wants to touch the, the buttons in the elevator. Nobody wants to um, touch the doorknob or the toilet handle or this, that, and the other. And um, voice has got a major role to play in increasing sort of the hygienic and the health, the health qualities of our world. Um, and we're gonna be seeing a whole lot more of that. Authentication and security. So um, already even before the pandemic, we were seeing the importance of um, authentication and uh, the fact that audio as well as video can be spoofed. Um, we're getting into an era where figuring out what's fake and what's real is really hard. And uh, the companies that are involved in that and the companies tying in voice recognition into um, security and authentication protocols, um, all you're going to be doing is hearing much more about them. And then shifting consumer preferences. So, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of repercussions across every vertical, every industry with COVID-19 and the pandemic. We're seeing people staying home more and uh, working remotely. We're seeing um, all sorts of shifts in our lifestyle and voice has an instrumental role to play in purchasing. Um, that's one example. Um, how we receive healthcare is another example. How we uh, operate in the car. Um, many, many, many uh, examples of voice uh, permeating and improving our world and uh, as a result of shifts in our consumerism uh, resulting from this pandemic that's occurred. So thank you very much for um, being part of the voice event. Thank you very much to Paul Hickey. Uh, I'm going to leave my contact information up here for a minute. If you liked uh, what you heard here, you thought it was even halfway interesting, you're not asleep yet. Um, this Week in Voice VIP, uh, the daily letter to these communities, uh, you would find that of great interest. Um, and that's over on Substack. Uh, you can reach out to me if you have trouble finding it. At VMetRock is my handle on Twitter. And with that, I'm going to hit stop share. Thank you very much for being here. Kudos to you, Paul, for what you put together. Thank you for the voice event. Thank you to everyone who is uh, watching this presentation. Feel free to reach out. Until next time. All right. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff from Bradley. It's great to have him. And uh, we've got him here live. There was some amazing action in the chat. 
I think we've got some good questions for Bradley. So uh, just want to confirm, test one, two. Bradley, you there? I'm, I'm here. You want me to start my video? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I'm live, live and direct from my, from my bunker here. Uh, cheers, Paul. Uh, nice job at the event. Thank you, sir. Sorry about those uh, lines on the screen. That was like producer fail here, you know. <laughs> Well, I was just trying to make sure I didn't do that. <laughs> no, that, everybody, okay. that was not Bradley's presentation. But um, the presentation was phenomenal. Great keynote speech. Even though we weren't able to be together in person, Bradley still brought it strong with the information. And, uh, yeah, thanks again. So we had some great um, questions come in. So I want to fire a few of them your way and then give, give Q an opportunity to talk to you as well. Um, and but but first, I just want to say your your email newsletter, the daily email newsletter, is top notch. Uh, uh, I think that's what you're doing on Substack. You mentioned that at the end of your keynote there. Nice job on that. Definitely. Appreciate where that. where can where can people get that? So if you go to thisweekinvoice.substack.com, and I'll type it into the chat. Um, uh, I, if, if somebody wants a 30 day trial subscription or whatever, happy to give it to them. You know, we've, we've been, it's been interesting to, to experiment with that because I've been wanting to start a newsletter for a while. And uh, it's, you know, you, you, you wonder how long can you do a daily letter that you write five or six times a week and it's giving me energy. It doesn't subtract anything. It gives me energy. And so I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going. That's awesome. All right. So one question from Nancy Van Rees, she was asking in regards to a website called batchusa.com. And she's, she's really wanting to know, I think about um, how to get blog posts out on Alexa or content from blog posts out on Alexa. And um, I know there's many, many options for this, but Bradley, what do you, uh, what do you think about the answer to that question? Yeah, I mean, I think that for most folks on on this, you know, attending this conference, the answer is going to be the flash briefing format to start with. Um, you know, that's so flash briefing format. Uh, that is something that uh, that's a term um, that doesn't have to be uh, associated exclusively with Alexa, but it generally is three, five, seven minute short form content where uh, usually on a daily basis or every other day or something like that, it flows into uh, Alexa devices and smart speakers and is just meant to be a quick hitting piece of content uh, that, that's more regularly consumed than perhaps what a normal Alexa skill is. And um, that's where I would start. You know, the, the overarching theme of Alexa and Google Assistant is do not spend money until you experiment with it and uh, start to get your feet wet. Now you can work with a partner, um, but don't dive in. It's not like, you know, a website, you know, you're going to need a website and you know, you know, uh, there, there's less risk to that. But with Alexa and Google Assistant, and even with Bixby and some of these other ones, take advantage of some of the tools that, that these major companies present to get your feet wet and experiment a little bit before you then dive in whole hog. And for the question about uh, the blog posts, flash briefings would be the way to do that. Yeah, and Nancy, I can definitely give you some resources on how to do the flash briefing. So just for the sake of time, we had another great question from Matt Carmen in Brooklyn. He runs an agency called Fermented Pixels. And Matt was asking about... Um, a client that is interested in improving their online learning, online tutoring abilities. And so I get really excited about these kinds of questions. And in this answer, Bradley, can you, some of the stuff you talked about in your keynote were maybe more first party capabilities on top of the voice devices. Can you talk about how skills and third party capabilities are somewhat needed for, for something like what Matt's asking about? Yeah, and I can give you a great example right off the bat, and it's one that I normally refer to in a, in, in presentations I give, uh, and, and I, I I refer to it in this one as well. You got to check out Novel Effect. 
So um, if you're asking about education, you know, the, the nexus of education and voice, uh, all roads for you start with novel effect. So um, you want to Google that, you want to try out their technology and see what that's about, because that'll paint you a picture that will help you answer the question of how to bring more online learning, you know, how to fuse your online learning initiatives with voice. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there's other, other paths you can go after that, but I would suggest starting there. Cool. And I've got one more. So Patrick Sweetman, who's joining us as part of our roundtable discussion, um, somewhere around 11.15, 11.30 a.m. Central Time. Uh, we all know each other from Project Voice as well. Pat asks, uh, is Bixby still viable with Adam Shire leaving Samsung and Samsung's talks with Google Assistant integration? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't we all like to know the answer to that? Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I see the rumor was that, um, Google was putting pressure on Samsung to, um, you know, abandon Bixby and integrate Google assistant everywhere, but, but to do so, I think it, it was either this past Friday or the Friday before that. And I don't, there's no indication whether that's happened or not. Um, but certainly Samsung has had some key defections and, you know, the, there's a, there's a reason for optimism and a reason for pessimism. You can choose whichever you want. The reason for pessimism is you, you can't replace Adam Shire, um, and him, him leaving, um, means something has gone wrong. Um, you know, there's just no way around that. But the, uh, the, the upside is that Samsung has been planning for some time to roll out uh, specific Bixby integration around smart TVs. And that's been the sort of great white hope for, uh, for Samsung is that, you know, yes, Bixby uh, has been slandered and maligned <laughs> and everybody wants to delete it off their phone. And that's been a lot of the media stuff. And there's a lot of great features of it. And unfortunately, it doesn't get as much attention as it should. But Samsung has been planning this whole time to come out with uh, much tighter Bixby integration around smart TVs, because obviously that smart TVs is an area where Samsung dominates. And the idea of combining specific voice assistant functionality with a very specific piece of hardware, you know, a mobile device does anything very uh, generalist sort of device. Uh, there's, if you know that you're on a smart TV, you can plan for, for being on a smart TV and you can do very specific things. And that's exactly what Bixby was going to do. So I'm, I'm interested to see if they're going to roll that out still um, or if they scrap it all together or what they're going to do right now. Uh, hey, you and I both <laughs> don't have any information on that. Good answer, though. I mean, I think you did a great job in your keynote talking about everyone winning with Alexa and Google Assistant. And it's a great question from Pat. But uh, I think focusing on Alexa and Google Assistant at the moment uh, for the foreseeable future is the way to go. So one last thing here, and I'll, I'll, I'll give Q Harrison an opportunity to unmute and turn his camera on if he's if he's available to ask you any questions. But I'll just say that you uh, got a lot of love uh, with the senior citizens um, portion of your presentation there. And uh, a couple of my favorite people out of Nashville, Galen Wilson and Jamie Dunham, both uh, both came in and, and were really interested in that. So so nice job there. And um, and uh, Q Harrison, do you have any, any anything you want to Ask Bradley before we move into our next uh, next session. Well, one, Bradley, it's always good to chat with you. Good uh, to see you, too. Second, your newsletter has been spectacular. I think you you might have been getting my emails every now and then. I'll ping you and be like, good, good update, good update. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, for someone that wants to learn more about voice and doesn't want to necessarily do a deep dive every, you know, two months or so, it's a quick like five minute briefing and like you read it, you'll learn something. If it's boring that day, the chances are Bradley's going to talk about something entirely different the next day. So you'll, you can get fascinated and up to speed. So I appreciate that. 
other than that, I mean, I like to check in with you about one topic. Bradley, you already know where I'm about to go. Paul, you already know where I'm going to go. How's the relationship been, man? You know, we, we found out that you married your Alexa speaker not too long ago. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're now almost towards the, the middle of this year, or past yeah. the middle of this year, almost towards the end, getting near it. You know, are you divorcing in COVID times or are you? See, what's funny about this is that half the people on this presentation are going to, uh, half the people in the Zoom conference are going to think that this is, the, the, that, uh, that I actually did that, which I think is funny by itself. But you um, did. Like, you, you are you're on record saying you married your Alexa device. Like, okay, well, yeah, um, yeah you know, look, uh, I, uh, it's funny you would say that because go ask Amazon and Google who I'm married to, and they're not going to tell you Amazon and Google. I don't know what their answer is going to be, um, but uh, go, go ask them. Uh, you know, ask Jeff Blankenberg when he's on this afternoon who I'm married to and see what he has to say. Um, and uh, your your answer may be a little bit different. Uh, hey Bradley, are you coming live from Utah? Uh, I'm no, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I mean, you sounded like a Mormon in Utah, you know, with the polygamy. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh, I gotta say, I, I appreciate the shout out for the newsletter, and and you sort of, you, I think you can appreciate this. I think you do appreciate this. It's like voices at the standpoint, voice right now. We're, we're a couple of years in, you know, Alexa came in and really um, was a major point of inflection for everything, just a flashpoint uh, for everything taken off. And now we are in storytelling mode for voice. We're at, we're at that time where the stories are out there waiting to be told. The senior citizens one is a perfect example. Um, what Front Porch has done, uh, what several other... Uh, healthcare providers have done, um, what, uh, what Google and Amazon themselves have done. Um, this, you know, and that's just one area. The stories are out there within voice and conversational AI waiting to be told. And the more they are told, the more other people will jump on board. And the more other people are able to use those stories then catalyze the, the uh, investment and the resources and the, the the effort that they need to. And that's what This Week in Voice VIP is about. I appreciate the comments on that. Trust me, we're just getting started. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for it. Bra Bradley, you ran away from the question, man. Like, we, how's the relationship? I just ignored going? it. Yeah, I just, ignored, I didn't run around. See, Bradley, Bradley, Bradley did a <laughs> phenomenal job of <laughs> answering the question. See, I'm not funny, so Q Harrison has to come in and, and replace the, <laughs> the lack of humor. So I appreciate you doing that, Q. All right, um, Bradley. What, what, one day we're going to, we're going to find out. I mean, it sounds like you've got a new fascination because it's like Google and Amazon are now your site, like, situationships you, you know i if, if i wanted to i i could maybe i'll have to write a letter about that and lose all of my subscribers oh wait did you marry siri is that what's going on you got a new main thing ryan paging ryan cowdery can you get the hook out for q i see you i see you on here cowdery let's get the hook. all right bradley it's been fun I, I you know i have to interrogate you on like who you're who you're married to every now and then. no i appreciate that and and uh that that can become our running gag q i, I you, you know i appreciate you paul i appreciate you, you as well you've you done a good job building up the nashville voice event i'm just honored to be part of it well you're you're a integral part of what we've been able to do and a, become a great friend and uh I think this is going to last for a long time, the momentum that we're all building together. So we got your back and thanks again for having ours and we'll keep uh, building some great stuff together.